Hi, and welcome to Good News Chapel. We are so glad to have you here with us today. If this is your first time visiting GNC, we'd like you to know that you and your family are very welcome here. To tell you a bit about us, our mission at GNC is to lead and empower all people into an abundant life with Jesus Christ. We'd love to see you here at our weekly services, which take place every Friday and Sunday. Every Friday evening at 7.30 p.m., we have something for every age group, from our GNC kids, GNC youth, the remnant young adults, and our adult Bible study. There's no better way to start the weekend, so we can't wait to see you back here next Friday. Also, every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., join us on our worship services as we spend time in worship and the Word. To stay connected with GNC, head over to our website where you can find info about us, what we believe, and all about our various ministries and events. Are you on social media? We've got you covered. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram or download our GNC app. Once again, we're so glad to have you with us. We know that God has something for you in today's service. This is the reason I sing 
for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason
good evening, everybody. You guys look exceptionally beautiful this Friday night. Why don't you go ahead and park it in your seat, but not for long. I just want to take a moment to say welcome. Is there anybody that's with us for the first time tonight? Would you just wave at me? I'm not weird. I'm not going to make you do anything crazy. I just want to smile at you. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here in the house of the Lord on this good Friday. Amen. Why is today good? There's a lot of answers. I can't hear any of you, but I'm sure they're great. Today for me is good because I celebrate Jesus who made a way for me when there wasn't a way. Amen. Amen. And he made a way for many of us in this place. Maybe for some of you that are here for the first time or you're joining us online, you've never heard about this way that was made by Jesus. But I want you to know that he loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And when Pastor Steve comes up later to minister out of the word of the Lord, you're going to find out a little bit more about that plan. Amen? So here at this church, we worship the Lord in many ways. We just worshiped him through song, and now we're going to take a, just a quick moment and worship him through our giving. Amen? I just want to read two scriptures. Why don't you turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 19? The book of Luke chapter 19, and when you're there, say donkey, and it'll make sense in two seconds. You guys are fast. Are those GNU students? I'm oh, just kidding. Let's read starting at verse 30 of Luke chapter 19. Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt or donkey tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord has need of it. Everyone say, the Lord has need of it. You know, when it comes to worshiping God in all the different ways that we do so as Christians, the posture of our heart should always be to worship him with everything that we have. There should never be a part of our life, a part of our heart, a part of our mind, or a part of our finances that we refuse to loose unto the work of the Lord. Amen? And so tonight, as you prepare to give, I want you to give with that scripture in mind. Amen? So ushers, why don't you come forward? We'll collect the evening's offering. And then as soon as the buckets pass you by, you can join us for a time of worship. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you, Father, that tonight we're going to encounter you. I thank you, God, for sending heaven's best for us. I pray that you bless every giver in this house tonight. In Jesus' precious mighty name I pray, amen. Yeah. 
know that he lives today? How many of you know that he lives today? Hallelujah. I know what day of the week it is. I know it's Friday. I know it's Good Friday. I know we're all supposed to be sad. We're all supposed to have frowns on our faces. We're supposed to go through the motions of a funeral. I'm sorry. I can't do that. My Jesus is alive. Uh, I like the words of, of Stephen. I just happen to be named after him. He says, and full of the Holy Spirit, he looked and gazed into heaven and he saw the Son of God sitting in the seat of honor. That's not a dead Jesus. That's a living Jesus. He's the one who sits at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you and I. He's the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. He discusses with his Father. You tell me when, Dad. I'm on my way down. I want to tell you something. We don't serve a dead person. We don't serve a martyr. We're not just remembering someone who was. We are remembering someone who is. And soon, and very soon, because only a living Jesus can come back, and soon he will return for his bride. We're standing here tonight, not mournfully. We're not standing here pretending, you know what, we'll be sad on Friday and happy on Sunday. That's not Christian living. Christian living is to be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Because we know, we know, we have one up on everyone else. Muhammad is dead. Krishna is dead. Buddha is dead. You name them, they're all dead. But Jesus is alive. I was supposed to save all this for Sunday, but I can't. It's bigger than me. And I want to tell you something. You sang it. Because I know. I hope you know tonight. I hope you know tonight. Who holds the future? I hope you know tonight. Who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I hope you know tonight. Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because if not, tonight you're going to know. One way or the other. Either you're going to accept Him. Receive Him. Bow your knee to Him. Give your life to Him. And He'll give you His life. Or you'll reject Him. Now my prayer for every single person in this place that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, by the end of this night, you'll know Him. That you'll be able to experience the joy that believers enjoy. That we walk in the confidence, not of like some dead religion or philosophy, but we walk in the confidence of our living Savior, the one who did it all. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we dedicate this time to you. Father, we thank you for Good Friday. We thank you for what Jesus did. We remember what Jesus did. We'll never forget what Jesus did. He did it for us. And I thank you, O oh God, that we are beneficiaries of what you have accomplished through your son, Jesus. I thank you, Father, for salvation. We don't take that lightly. We once were lost, but we've been found. We once were blind, and the veil has been removed. We once had no hope, but now we have more than hope. We have an assurance. We thank you because once no one knew our name, but you know our name. You wrote our name down in the book. And we thank you because one day when we stand in your presence, we'll hear our name loud and clear. And with great joy, we'll enter into paradise with you for all eternity. I thank you for tonight. I thank you for what you have prepared from long ago. Lord, look at all these people that are here on this night. It's not a tradition. It's not just some religious thing that we do once a year. Father, we come to you because we know that you have all the power, all the wisdom, that you know all things, and we're safe and secure in your arms because of Christ. Holy Spirit, move in this place today. Begin to work on every heart and mind, especially those that are hostile to the gospel but are here anyway. Let them understand that this is a divine appointment with their maker. And tonight they have an opportunity to make peace with the God of heaven and the earth. Father, we thank you for the opportunities you give us over and again. We thank you for your abounding grace. We thank you that you haven't given up on us. You haven't given up on the world. You're still drawing men to yourself. And I pray that tonight be no different. Father, as we open up the word, we look at it and we 
stand in awe of what you've done. Speak to our hearts, we ask. Be with every single one that's here tonight. Even those that are watching online, oh God, you're able to do amazing things across a stream. Let your will be done, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone with one voice says, Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Now before you're seated, why don't you greet a couple of people? Maybe you've never seen them before. Don't greet your wife. Greet someone new. Musicians, thank you. Praise God. Good Friday. How many of you love Good Friday? Good Friday. The good Friday. It's, it was a Good Friday. It's going to be a Good Friday. It's going to end a Good Friday, and then we'll get into Good Saturday. Praise God. I want to read from the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, I'd like to read a few verses, about 14. There's going to be a lot of scripture reading tonight. I think that's important. Um, I think the days of men speaking their opinions should be gone. I think the days of men reading the Bible should be at the forefront. I think that's what should fill the churches. Because God knows how many men's opinions have ruined everything. But you can't go wrong when you read the word of God. Amen? Amen. Exodus 12, starting at verse 1. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year to you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. And the animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter the lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and on the top of their door frames of their houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with the bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed. Wear your sandals. Carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on the doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. I've entitled tonight's message, A Day to Remember. A Day to Remember. Now, I overshot the Good Friday reading, the the normal Good Friday reading by about 1,500 years. Uh, And the reason why is because I want to go back to where it began as far as the origins of this meal and what we're going to be celebrating and what we're celebrating on this Good Friday. Now, before we look at this passage, the, the word I want to focus on is the word remember. Remember. Can you remember that? I hope so. It's a a very important word. It may come to you as a surprise that the injunction or the order to remember is the most often repeated command in all of Scripture. Memory or to remember 
I think you guys know what it means. It's the act of recalling a person or an event. If I say, remember this, you'll go back into your files in your mind and you'll think about a past event or a person and you will reconstruct that event or that person as best as your memory um, can. Now, that's how I've always thought of it. Even if you were to break down the word itself, remember, is to go back and bring together the members of thought that have been separated through the course of time. To reconstruct thoughts and events. And oftentimes when you read the scripture, it's often presented in a negative or as a prohibition in saying, do not forget. If the Bible tells you don't forget. It's telling you what? Remember. In addition to that, the scriptural concept of memory Or the act of remembering is not limited to cognitive recall. It's not just something that happens in the head. It's not just about using the power of your imagination to bring back to mind what may have passed in the past. Rather, remembering in the scripture implies acting in accordance to that which you remember. In other words, when you remember something, it's supposed to spur you on to do something. If I, you know, like sometimes my wife will say to me, you remember what you promised at the altar. <laughs> And the reason why she's reminding me to remember is so that I will do something about what I said back then. I remember our vows. It went something like this. Steve, if you ever do something wrong, No, <laughs> wrong about. It was more along the lines of, I will prefer you above myself. And we have worked very hard over the course of our marriage to make sure that we lived by that part of our vows. And so when someone tells you to remember, when you read the scripture and it says, remember something, it's for the sake of doing something. Um, It's interesting because we oftentimes limit remembering to the past. When it's remembering what was said or done in the past to cause us to act or respond in the future. That's one of the reasons um, why... Oh, so let me, let me just say it. You can also remember things of the future. Did you know that? Think about it. Things that have not happened yet, you can remember. And it's not a question of pre-science. It's not about you knowing the future. It's about remembering what someone said that they would do. It's called a promise. And when you remember a promise, it means that future, it will be fulfilled. So, for instance, the Word of God is replete with that. Remember the goal that's set before you. Remember what's to come. Those are remembering things that were said in the past that affect the future. And it's very important for us to remember. Now, one of the reasons why I can't handle the religious memorial aspect of a night like tonight that's been adopted by the church is because Good Friday becomes a mourning time. And we kind of mentioned it before. I think that's what was in my heart from this morning or from this week as I was preparing for tonight. It becomes a time of mourning It becomes a time of remembrance, but we remember something very bad that happened. How many of you like the idea of suffering? No one likes the idea of suffering. No one likes thinking about Jesus, you know, being ripped apart and torn to shreds. No one likes to think about Jesus being nailed to a cross. No one likes to think about that. So what happens is in the church world, when it comes to Good Friday, you even have Christians that are asking themselves, what's so good about it? Good Friday is amazing because it was necessary. And so when we remember, we're not supposed to sit here and remember with a frown on our face. We're not supposed to sit here and recall things to bring about an attitude of sorrow and pain when we remember, by remembering what Jesus did is what Jesus promised and what's to come. When we remember what happened on this faithful day 2,000 years ago, 
It's to bring to our recollection that he's alive, that he's sitting on the throne, that we don't have to wait till Sunday, and that there's a lot more to the story that still has to come, so you and I should be living in expectation and hope. You know, I want to tell you this, just so that you know, Jesus has been dead for a total of three days, and that's it. He doesn't die every year. He doesn't come back to earth and say, listen, let's do it again for the 2,000th and 24th time. You know, for, forgive the math there. You'll you figure it out. The 1,996th time. Even that's probably wrong. Jesus isn't coming back saying, okay, let's go through it again. Because you know what? The first time really didn't work. And you guys need to see it for yourself. No. Jesus died for three days. And then he rose to life. And he's alive forevermore. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Just because he died once, it means he will never die again. Well, pastor, that's a pretty bold statement. I'll tell you why no one can kill Jesus. Because no one killed Jesus. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Catholics. It wasn't the blacks. It wasn't the whites. It wasn't any of those people. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own will. So, Jesus has no desire to lay down his life again. He did it once. He's the son of God. And what he did was and will always be powerful. Amen. Now remember that. Remember that. Remember that the next time you find yourself in a situation. Remember that the next time you find yourself in a situation where you think that things are hopeless. Remember that when, you know, the enemy tries to whisper things into your ear and tells you that your faith is all for naught. Remember that if bad news comes. Remember our Jesus who is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father and he still has the final say because you belong to him. Can you remember that? That's not just something for the past. That's remembering for the future. And it would, be, it would do us very well if every single one of us would remember that. Now tonight you're going to hear the word remember. A lot. My hope is that by repeating the word remember, you will never forget. That was a joke. <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of the backstory about what we read in Exodus chapter 12. I think it's important. I want us to remember, again, not what happened 2,000 years ago, but what happened 3,500 years ago. When God was in the midst of delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt. You know, again, this has been on my heart for a long time and I've possibly repeated it over and again and, and people are saying, what's his problem? Because I think the Old Testament is very important. Maybe it's because I've been inspired because I was teaching my course which has to do with the Old Testament. But that's not it. You can never fully appreciate anything that Jesus has done if you ignore half of the book. You need to know the story. Because 1,500 years before Jesus would ever enter Jerusalem for the last time, before his crucifixion, I want you to understand that God was painstakingly drawing up plans for how things were going to go down in the future. You know, I, I, I take issue with people that say, ah, those things. In the old. Study. Take the time. Take the time to understand. You know, when, I, when, I, when people challenge the scripture, by the way, I'm not worried about when people challenge the scripture. You know, the scripture is powerful enough to be challenged. Always come out on top. No man has debunked it, and they never will. It's airtight, because it wasn't written by just a man. It was the words of God himself. It is the story of us. It's the story of God's love for us. And no man will ever be able to deride it or change it or prove it wrong in any way. God was painstakingly... I got a new haircut. That's why it's doing that. <laughs> it's not the sound man's fault. Stop looking at him. 
He's a nice guy, has family, kids. Leave him alone. <laughs> Exodus chapter 12 is the story of the Passover and Israel's flight from Egypt. It's where the people were given instruction to select the lamb and to prepare it for sacrifice. It's where they were commanded to take the blood of the sacrifice and to spread it on the lintels and the doorposts of every home so that the death angel would Pesach, which is the Hebrew word for what we call Passover, meaning to skip over the home of every, the home of every person who had a firstborn in it and that those in the land that had the blood on the lintels and the doorpost would be spared from death, both in Egypt and Israel. And that's a very important thing. It wasn't just the Egyptians that were subject to that, that curse. Even the Israelites had to obey. Even they had to make sure. It wasn't just a default position. They had to act out in faith. When it comes to this feast, it was to be followed with precision. This had to be done the night before their exit from Egypt. It was a story also that had to be repeated over and over again. And when the children had asked their fathers, why do you say this story over and again? He says, because I need to tell you what God did for us when we came out of Egypt. It was to be practiced and repeated. It was to be passed down from generation to generation. And therefore, the story had to be told over and over and over and over and over again. Why? So that it could be remembered. Here's a little bit more on the Passover. These are some of the details that we as modern day Christians tend to skip over and tend to forget. I won't move. This will be very hard. I'm half Italian. No, I'm all Italian. God established this feast as a new year for the people of Israel. I'm going to give you some background, okay? It might be a little bit technical, but please bear with me because it's going somewhere, I promise. It was to be celebrated in the month of Aviv, or Abib, but it's pronounced Aviv. Aviv means barely ripening, which is indicative of the spring which was the season that this celebration was to take place in. Spring is often associated with what? New? New what? I can't hear you. New life, new beginnings. And so, furthermore, it applied to the nation of Israel itself as they were leaving Egypt as a, a fledgling, barely ripe nation. And as I mentioned earlier, the orders that were given were very specific. Like when you read the story, I'm sure that there were details in there that you said, oh, that's not important. What's that for? But not when it comes to God. They were very specific details. Notice the days that were mentioned. A lamb had to be selected. Great, no problem. Why don't you just select the lamb? Notice what the Bible says. It says, I want you to select the lamb on the 10th day. You know, when, when God gives a command, we don't really have an option. You have to follow it the way he says it. Because there's a reason for it. It couldn't be selected on the ninth day. And it couldn't be selected on the eleventh day. Preparation had to begin as indicated on the tenth day. It couldn't be done whenever people fancied to get these things done. Especially considering that it was the first time that this was ever going to happen. It had to be done right the first time. On the 14th day, I don't know if you noticed that part, on the first month of Aviv, which, by the way, later on in the book of Esther, they, they renamed the month of Aviv to Nisan, which, by the way, Nisan means the month of flowers, so you still have that idea of spring in it, right? They're used interchangeably. It was on that day that the lamb that was selected on day 10 was to be killed, you know, you read that story, like I read that story as a, as a, as a, a, a man of this generation, of this time, and, you know, I, I'll just go through the details, I'll just read it, say, oh, look, sometimes when I do my devotional reading, it, there's not very little devotion in it. Sometimes if I'm on a schedule, I just want to read, I want to get through it. I'm not thinking about what's the 10th day, what's the 14th, what does it matter? But to God, he put it there for a reason so that you and I, when we would see things that would cause us to ask questions, that maybe we would stop and dig a little deeper. 
It was on that day, on that 14th day, that the lamb had to be killed. It's, it's not just because God is fastidious. It's not because God is capricious and it's not because God is picky. It's not because his favorite number is 10 or his second favorite number is 14. He's showing us, as I said on Sunday, that he is in all the details. You know when Jesus came and they challenged him, he said, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. Every jot and every tittle, every little piece of it It's going to be fulfilled, and he meant it when he said it. The fulfillment of the Passover, I think you guys know this already, and maybe you don't, and if you don't, I'm more than happy to tell you that the fulfillment of the Passover feast is in Jesus Christ. He is our Passover lamb, and I think that's easy to see. But so that there's no doubt, Jesus always goes a step beyond Not only does he fulfill the overt, big details, he goes beyond and fills the minor details of that role of being the Lamb of God, of being the Passover Lamb that would be sacrificed. If you were here on Sunday, you might remember. You see how I threw in the word remember? I hope you remember. You might remember that we spoke on the the triumphal entry of Jesus. It's not just some detached detail. So let me help you tonight. I want to connect some more dots for you because I want you to understand how marvelous, like the old song, how marvelous, how wonderful Jesus is. I want you to understand the, the, and and I don't take it for granted anymore, the, the painstaking details that he put there so that anyone who's a skeptic will understand, no, this guy He did things that no one could do. He fulfilled the prophecies about himself, not just the general ones. It's impossible for him to have faked it. He fulfilled the minor details that no mere human, no mere mortal could have control over. So let's get to the New Testament for a second. Because we read the Old Testament, let's read the New Testament. Uh, I'll have you turn to the Gospel of John chapter 12. I'm going to show you a very minor detail, but it means a lot. Are you with me? How many of you are thinking this is a bad Friday? It's a good Friday. Amen. Amen. John chapter 12. Verse 1. Tells us that six days before the Passover... Jesus was in a town called Bethany. I'll read it to you. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man who raised Jesus from the dead. How many of you know when the Passover was celebrated? On what day of Nisan or the day of Aviv? On the 15th day. That's when the Passover celebration began. So let me, let's do some math together. I was good at math for like, you know, grade three and four. After five, it was downhill. (laughs) So I wonder I made it this far. I want you to do math with me. The 15th day of Nisan. And you know what? Jesus appears six days before that day. So what's 15 minus six? So Jesus was in Bethany on day nine. Of the month of Nisan. Well, maybe you're not very good in, you know, uh, Judean geography, but Bethany was only a few miles from Jerusalem. So on day 9 of Nisan, Jesus is in Bethany. Now let's read verse 12 of John chapter 12. It says, the next day, which would be day what? Day 10. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept the city. What was day 10? What was day 10 of Nisan or the day 10 of Aviv? What was it supposed to be? It was the day that the Jews were supposed to select the lamb for slaughter, which corresponds to the day that that, that they would collect the lamb on the 10th day. So now think about it for a second. It just so happens to coincide with Palm Sunday. Now, I want you to think about things and the details the way God does them. On the 10th day, the Lamb of God, 
presented himself to Jerusalem. On the tenth day, according to the law, according to the the ritual of Passover, on the tenth day, the lamb that God selected himself breaks the threshold of the city of Jerusalem. Almost 1,500 years after that command was given, 1,500 years after the people celebrated the first Passover and celebrated the Passover lamb, 1,500 years later to the day, Jesus Christ enters into Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan. You know what? He could have showed up on Tuesday. And it would have been fine. He could have showed up on Wednesday. And you know what? It would have been fine. He could have showed up on Thursday and went to the cross on Friday. And it still wouldn't have been a problem. It would have been fine. But you know what? When it comes to Jesus, he obeyed the law. And he obeyed his father. And he wanted to show people how to obey the father down to the finest details. Some of you are still lost right now. Let's do the counting together. If you count according to Jewish reckoning, which by the way, the the next day begins at twilight. What do you you guys know what twilight is? What's twilight? It's not the saga with the vampires. (laughs) I'm Team Edward. I think I am Team Edward. I, I don't know. I don't remember. I have his poster. It's the eyes. That's a joke. I don't, I don't have his poster. I have a wallet size. That's a different story. When did, they sell it? when did they start a new day? They didn't start a new day at 6 a.m. They started the day. The new day started counting at around 6 p.m. Whenever the sun was going down. I'll say 6 p.m. just as a rule of thumb. So if we start counting. Day 10. Before 6 p.m. The lamb was selected. Day 11, the Tuesday, before 6 p.m., that's day 11. Now the Wednesday, before 6 p.m., after 6 p.m., that's Wednesday. Then you get to Thursday, after 6 p.m., that's day 13, or the 13th of Nisan. Then day 14, the Friday before sundown, on the 14th day that the lambs would be slaughtered for sacrifice, Jesus was sacrificed as the lamb. On the 10th day, he broke the threshold of Jerusalem. On the 14th day, according to the law, he was nailed to the cross. He died at around 3 p.m. If you read the story carefully, which we will later, Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. They like to do things nice and early. And from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours, Jesus hung on the cross, bled out, and died. And that's what the Gospel of Mark tells us. After which, on day 15, the Passover feast would begin and it would last for one week. You know, we read out of Exodus before. And the thing that stuck out to me is that it says, in in verse 14, it says, This is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for when? For all time. You know, when you read about the other festivals, it says this is a, 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 this is a law or this is a requirement for the people of Israel. This is the only one that says, and this is a law for all time. Jesus was crucified on the 14th day of Nisan, according to the law. Jesus went to the cross on cue. 1,500 years after the people were released from Egypt, he went to the cross. And it's a day to remember. You know, Jewish people have been celebrating this day ever since. But the major significance of their celebration is a commemoration of their deliverance from, from, and exodus from Egypt. All it is for them is that we were freed from 400 and some odd years of slavery. They followed through with the order. They were obedient. To this very day, the people of Israel or, or the, the Jews celebrate this Passover because it is a law and a statute for all time. But you know what? It went beyond the Jewish people. It's something that you and I celebrate. We may not sit and celebrate the Passover Seder, which if you want to participate in a Passover Seder because you're interested or you'd like to know more, I think it's a wonderful experience because it's full of symbolism and significance. And the thing is, when you celebrate the Passover Seder with Jewish people, 
you as a believer, as a Christian, see Jesus in every single symbol that's there. Don't do it because you want to obey the law. You've been freed from the law. I take issue with people that are looking to get back into the law. Jesus died so that we would be freed from the curse of the law. No need to get back into the law. You can't win your salvation anyway. That's why you and I need Jesus. Amen. Well, the Jews have been celebrating that forever, for, for, for all that time. We celebrate it also. Because we see Jesus as the fulfillment of what was said 3,500 years ago. We, too, are supposed to remember. But we can't celebrate. We can't get caught up with, with, with remembering posthumously. What is posthumously? Okay, good. We can't just get caught up in the idea of remembering a dead person. Because that's what most Christians do anyway. Every time it gets to Good Friday, they weep and cry. And they're not weeping and crying because they, they're, they're, they're joyful. They're weeping and crying because they're remembering Jesus is dead. When it comes to this day, my question is, or my questions are, what are you remembering? Are you remembering a dead Savior? By the way, those two terms are mutually, you can't have a dead Savior. Are you paying tribute to a martyr like so many people do? Do you weep on this night as though you're standing at a gravesite? Do you remember the full tomb or the empty tomb? Do you remember only because it's a duty, a Christian duty? All Christians do this. Is it your observance? Is your observance simply tradition? I do this because we've always done this. Is it just a reconstruction of the suffering of Christ for you? Does today cause you to be sorrowful? Or does it cause you to be grateful? Does it cause you to become sullen and inactive? Or does it cause you, when you remember, to act? Because that's what it's supposed to do. What stuck out to me again is that Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. This is a day to remember. And if you remember my opening remarks you'll know that it's not about just recollecting uh, thoughts and ideas from the past, but it's to re-bring or regather those thoughts and memories so that it will spur you on to do something amazing and something wonderful. It's an ongoing ordinance because the church of Jesus Christ is not meant to be passive or stagnant. The church of Jesus Christ is never meant to just stand still and do nothing and watch things go by. There's supposed to be a reaction. For the Jew, the Passover was to celebrate a past victory. It was a past victory to fuel future hope. It was designed as a celebration for all time because it was a reminder that at all times... The same God that delivered them from slavery in Egypt would stand by his covenant so long as they stood by theirs. That's what today is for the believer. When we come to the Good Friday portion of the Holy Week, it's not to shed tears of sorrow. You can shed tears, but they should be tears of joy because our salvation has been won through Christ Jesus once and for all time. Once and for all time by the perfect once and for all time sacrifice of the chosen Lamb of God by the name of Jesus Christ, to whom there is no other, there is no one who can compare, there is only one. Amen. We, like the people of Israel who were freed from their bondage in Egypt, have been emancipated from our sins because just restitution has been made. The wrath of God has been satisfied, and all who acknowledge Jesus Christ are the beneficiaries of salvation through his sacrifice. Notice my words, all who recognize, all who recognize. You know what, I've been around this ministry for a long time now. I've heard people say, you know what, Christianity is exclusive. It's absolutely not. Because the thing is, it's open to all, and all who recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, will be forgiven and will be saved without exception. This is a day to remember and to remember all the promises, to remember all the benefits and all the blessings that have been afforded to us by Christ Jesus. 
It's a time when we are to demonstrate our faith in the work of Christ. Did you hear that? It's a time when we are to demonstrate our faith in the work of Christ Jesus. If you really believe that you serve a risen Savior, you're not going to stand pat and you're not going to shy away and you're not going to be quiet, but you're going to shout it from the rooftops. You're going to shout it from the mountaintops because I'm going to tell you what, when Jesus was died, when Jesus died and was nailed to the cross, it wasn't a loss. It wasn't an L. It wasn't posting an L. It was the win of all wins. It's a time when we are to come together as a family. You know, I, I wish more Christians would understand the, the family you belong to. I wish that more Christians would understand. But you know what? I realize that in the human mind that blood is thicker than oh, the blood of Christ. It's a time when we come together as a family, as a people who are once estranged from one another, who had nothing to do, who would have nothing to do with one another, to come together and celebrate. Because we share this one thing in common that we were all lost and we were all hopeless and we were all going to hell in a handbasket and had it not been for the grace and love of God, had it not been for the mercies of God in sending his son Jesus to be, to be manhandled and to be nailed to a cross, we would have never had the opportunity to even stand blameless before God as forgiven men and women. It's a time when we are to remember who we have become. You know, for the Israelite, it was a time for them to remember who they had become because most of them were born as slaves. All of them were born as slaves, as a matter of fact, when they were in Egypt. But when they were let loose and they were allowed to leave Egypt, all of a sudden they were no longer slaves, but now they were sons and daughters. They were the nation of Israel. They were a different people. And you and I are to remember who we've become because of him. Because of Jesus, and, and not shy away, but stand up and do his will with great confidence. I want to tell you something. When you serve a God who died and rose to life again, to never be brought down ever again, but who reigns supreme, it should bring to you a confidence that you've never experienced in this world before. Where you start to look at life different. And understand that the one that you serve is actually the author of the victory. Where the one that you serve will never leave you or forsake you. Where the one who you serve took it all on himself. Took all the punishment, the wrath, the sin and all those things for you. So that you could live a powerful, wonderful, impactful life for him. I want to tell you something. Don't ever get tired of repeating the story of Good Friday. That's one of the things we have to adopt from the Jewish people. They just keep saying the story over and over again. None of them were born in Egypt. None of them. None of them. And they repeat the story as if they were there. Because they were. They repeat that story because had they not been freed, they wouldn't be. They repeat it over and over again. Religiously precisely, and they're doing it, and I'm sorry to say they're doing it aimlessly because the Messiah has already come. They don't understand the fulfillment, but you and I have to take a chapter out of their book, and we must repeat the story over and again, and that we must never get tired of repeating the story. Don't go the way of the world that thumbs its nose at tradition. Don't go the way of the world that's constantly looking for something new. I'm going to tell you what. If you're constantly basing your life and experience on something new, I'm telling you, it's built on sand. It's a, more, it's a question of time before it falls apart. But when you base yourself on the reliability of the ancient story, the story that had been written before the foundation of the earth was even put in place, when you build your life on that, you build your life on the rock, and when the storm comes... When the problems come, you will not be shaken. You will not be moved. Don't ever 
Go the way of the world and thumb your nose at tradition. This isn't mere tradition. This is God's flex. Sorry, I'm trying to be contemporary. <laughs> do we still use that word or was that like last week and now we moved on to another? What word do we use now? Exactly, that's what I thought. So this was God showing off. This was God, you know, it's like, you know, when you read ancient or, or, or literature from antiquity, you hear about these gods that are destroying worlds and destroying each other, trying to, 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 to best the other one for supremacy and all that stuff. Not our God. You know how our God shows off? He dies. And the world looks at it, that's stupid. Exactly. Because to people that are perishing, the wisdom of God is foolishness. But to those who know God, that's the wisdom of God in action. Because when God wants to show off, he just lays himself down and says, watch this. And when everyone thinks that they've got him, he raises up in power. And he shows the world, here I am, never to be done in again. <laughs> only God, only God is not afraid to die. Only God is not afraid to die because he knows he has ultimate power. And he has ultimate power, you know what to do? To save He has the ultimate power to raise. He has the ultimate power to bless. And he has the ultimate power to keep. The cross was a torture device. The cross, the old song says, was an emblem of suffering and shame. And only someone like Jesus can take something like the cross, the most vile of all torture instruments that existed in the Roman Empire. That was started off by the Chaldeans, by the way, and say, hey, I'm going to take that That's the worst you can do. I'm going to take it around. I'm going to take it and I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to use it as a symbol of my power over you. I'm going to use it as a symbol of my power over death and the grave. I'm going to use it as a symbol so that all people who follow me will bear the cross. His death on the cross was a vicarious event. When he took our death, our guilt and shame and sin... So we look at the cross of Christ and we look unto our Savior who is no longer on it, but he reigns in the heavens forevermore, seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father. And I want to reassure you of that tonight, that you can place your trust in the living Savior. You can place your trust in a God who didn't find it a fearsome thing to come to earth and take on the form of his own creation so that he could walk among us, so he could sympathize with us, so he can know us, so he can say, listen, I know what you're going through. He just doesn't get us, by the way. He understands us deeply. And he understands what we need. And he understands how to fix our problem. He knows how to get to the root of every problem, which is called sin. He's no longer on that cross. And tonight you have an opportunity or you will have an opportunity in just a few more minutes to think things through. And if you walked into this place and you have no confidence except for in yourselves, you're in trouble. But I want you tonight to be like a lot of us that are in this place and put your confidence in Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God, the resurrected one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know what? I, I don't want to tire of reading the story. I don't ever, I am never going to tire of reading the story because of what, of what Jesus did. And that's what I wanted to do. That's how I wanted to end tonight, if you'll allow me. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles out and we're going to read. Like I said at the beginning, I prefer to hear the word of God than the opinions of men, even my own opinions. But we're going to read it together. Mark chapter 15, verses six, starting at verse 16. This is the story. This is the fulfillment. Verse 16, the soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters. Hold on one moment. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the government headquarters called the Praetorium. And they called out the entire regiment. Yeah, I'm this little guy. Some teacher. They had to call out the full regiment. They dressed him in purple in a purple robe and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they st struck him on the head with a reed stick and they spit on him and dropped to their knees in mock worship. 
And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again, and they led him away to be crucified. A passerby by the name of Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the, the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. And then the soldiers nailed him to the cross, and they divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said that you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then save yourself and come down from the cross. And the leading priests and teachers of the religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? Which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said, let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. And then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the Son of God. Amen. I'll never tire of that story. I'll always look to that story. And I will always remember that story. And I will use it as the fuel to move. I will use it as my fuel for hope. And you should too. I will use it so that I will run the race that God has called us to run and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because if that's what he would do to, get, to win my life, it's the least I could do for him. You know, God's all over the details. You know, you read that story and, and you know, again, we, we have the tendency of doing that. We'll read the details and say they're so unimportant. They're just there. Look how terrible they are. But like, pay attention. You know, in that story, it said that they put a crown of thorns on his head. It said that they nailed him to a cross, and they pierced his hands, and they pierced his feet. And you know, all those things have significance. You know why a crown of thorns? Because Jesus came to reverse the curse that was put on the, on the, on the world because of the fall of man. If you know the Bible well, it says that when the fall took place, that the ground would produce thorns and thistles. And when they put that crown of thorns on his head, it was a, a sign that he was reversing the curse from Genesis. They nailed him to a cross. Why? Because it was a tree that men fell, and so they nailed him to a cross because it was a tree that was going to remedy the problem. They nailed his hands to the cross, and some of you say, well, they had to hold him somewhere, but it was really a sign of, 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 of taking on the penalty because hands are the gateway to sin. I don't know if you remember the story of Adam and Eve, but it was Eve that grabbed the, app or the fruit from the tree and said, this is good to eat. And they nailed his feet so that we wouldn't run away. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they did is they ran from God and hid. Jesus did all those things to fix the problems that man made and that man brought and you know what? I'm going to tell you this, especially for those of you that don't know Christ. But for those of you that do, you should really pay attention to these details and remember them and cherish them. But for those of you that don't know Christ tonight, I want to tell you something. God loves you. Pastor, how do you know he loves me? Because he sent his son to die for you. He didn't just send his son to die for a select few. He didn't send his son so that we could start our own little religion and have our own little gatherings once a year and talk about what he did. No, no, no. He died for you and for me. Amen. And there's so much more. There's so much more. 
You know, tonight's a special night because we're going to come to this table that's set before you, set before us. And had it not been for Jesus being tortured and crucified, we couldn't even partake of this meal that we're going to take part of tonight. He prepared a table for us. What God, what Savior would serve? He prepared a table for us with his body and with his blood. And I'm going to read an account found in 1 Corinthians, and in a few moments we're going to partake. And in 1 Corinthians it says this in verse 23. It says, on the night that he was betrayed... That was the night before he was crucified. The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. It took, by the way, it it took God to become a man to offer his body. And it couldn't be anything less than that. The body of a mere man could not satisfy or bring atonement for any kind of sin. And that's why Jesus had to do it. And then he says this, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Associated to remembering is the action, do this. And when you do this, it should push you to do more. In verse 25, it says, Then in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. There could be no new covenant. What is a new covenant? Remember, we just read out of Exodus just a few moments ago. The old covenant was every year you take a lamb, you set it apart on the 10th day, you take care of it, and on the 14th day you kill it. And you commemorate such an event. Later on, you take another lamb and you kill that and you shed its blood so that it'll forgive you for your sins for the year. And you're to do that year after year after year after year after year. And that's just a small part of the sacrificial system. That was the old covenant. You want to stay in good terms with God, then you got to do these things over and over and over again. But the new covenant, the stipulations of the new covenant is, I give my life for you You be faithful and love me. And that's it. No sacrifice year after year. We don't get together on Easter and we don't grab a lamb and build an altar in the church and sacrifice it and light it up and sit back and have a roasted meal. We don't go through any of that kind of stuff. We are recipients of a new and better covenant is what the scripture tells us. We are blessed beyond measure. So when it comes to a night like tonight, it's not a night of mourning. Jesus isn't expecting us to sit back and wail and cry and say, I wish you were here. I wish, I wish you were alive right now. No, he is alive. And he's sitting in the heavenlies and we are the sons and daughters of God and we benefit from all that. Now tonight we're going to come to this table and we are going to remember. We're going to remember what Jesus did. We're going to remember the price that he paid. We're going to remember the benefits of this meal and everything that Jesus has done for us. But before we do that, I want to make sure that everyone has a seat at this table. Because I think it's very rude to have a meal and have onlookers. When the thing is, Jesus, again, didn't do this for a select few people. He did it for every single one of us. Now, before we get to the table, I just want to make sure that everyone in this place knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because you can't partake of this meal without knowing him. The Bible tells us that it's useless. What what do you have to do with Christ if you reject him? What do you have to do with this meal if it means absolutely nothing to you? It will simply be a piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice. For us, it's still bread and grape juice, but it represents the body of Christ, the broken body of Christ. His body was broken so that my body could be made whole. He shed his blood so that my sins can be forgiven. The only way sins could be forgiven is with the shedding of blood. That's it. And Jesus did it. Not regular blood. You know, you have all these wackos out there sacrificing chickens and doing all that kind of stupidity. This is the blood of God. I say it like that and some people are stunned by it. Well, who is Jesus? He's God. He shed his blood so that you and I can be forgiven. 
to satisfy the wrath of God, to take upon himself the sins of the world, to take your sins away, to make you new. You saw it in the video at the beginning. It says, you know, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who come to Christ are new creatures, new creations. The old is past. All things have become new. I don't know why you're here tonight. Well, I know why you're here tonight. You may not know why you're here tonight. Maybe someone invited you. Said, you know what? There's this place. They have like good music, the cool lighting and all that kind of stuff. That, it's nice. Scudek. And this crazy guy that just spits when he preaches. But <laughs> I mean, you're here tonight. And I'm going to tell you what. There's a lot of people that have this guy. There's a lot of people that don't even believe in God. They say, I don't believe there's a God. But yet they're asking, God, if you're real, speak to me. I've heard that story a thousand times. You're here tonight because God answered that request. I'm not God, by the way. I just want to let you know I'm nowhere near him. But I read from the word of God tonight. And he's speaking to you tonight. And he's telling you this is the story. This is the power. This is, this is the game changer. This is where your life changes for good. This is where I forgive your sins and you live for me. That's it. Now, I don't need to know your past. You don't have to come to the altar tonight and, and say, you know what, forgive me, Father. First of all, I'm not your father. Second of all, I can't remember much. And it's none of my business to know your sins. I'll tell you what, God knows them all. And it doesn't matter how bad you think you are. And it doesn't even matter how good you think you are. Because the Bible makes it very clear that everyone, without exception, other than Jesus himself, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need the atoning work of Christ. There's not one exception to that rule. And you have a choice tonight. You can either receive Christ and come to the table. You can, you can make this story that we read about what Jesus did your own. And say, this is the God I serve. Powerful God. He's not some fickle God who's trying to prove himself. This is the God, the one and only God who loves me and laid down his life for me. And it's for every single one. If you're here tonight, and I'll tell you what hangs in the balance. Your sins are forgiven if you come to Christ. Heaven becomes your home. Your citizenship changes. You're, you're still Canadian, so to speak, but I'm talking the temporary status stays the same, but your eternal status changes. You're a citizen of heaven. I'm going to tell you, if anyone's under the delusion that they don't need Christ to go to heaven, you're in trouble. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. There's no back door to heaven. There's only one way, and he's the way. There's only one door, and he's the door. And that's the only way in. You can try. You can try to go to the back door, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to tell you, you'll get there. You'll be very disappointed because there won't be one. You can try to figure things out your way, and I'll tell you what, I hate to be a spoiler, but I'm going to tell you, you'll never make it. Because even our best act, are like filthy rags before God. But why not do it the easy way? Why not give your life to Jesus? Believe on the one. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible says. I'll never get tired of, of, of repeating John 3, 16. Never. You know, there was a time when I would repeat it week after week and I would get mad at myself. i say, Steve, you're running out of material. You can't get better than the gospel in 25 words. Some of you would wish that I would preach in 25 words or less. But I can't. I have a big mouth. My mom told me. I never get tired of, of, of repeating John 3.16 because it's the absolute truth. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to be brutalized, to be beaten, to be spit on, to be mocked. To be nailed to a cross and laughed at. To bore a crown of thorns. To be pierced in the hands and the feet and the side. To shed his blood. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever, love that word, K 
can't emphasize it enough. And it's in the Greek. That whosoever, I don't care what lifestyle you come from. I don't care if you're confused. I don't care if you've done some shady or questionable things. No, I'll tell you what, God doesn't care. Whosoever believes in Him will not perish. The other side of that is, if you don't believe in Him, you will perish. And the thing, that's not fair. No, it's absolutely fair. Because the boss, the creator of it all, made the rules. And he's telling you, this is the cheat code. This is it. This is how you get in. The only thing that stops us is our pride. We know better. The only thing that stops us is our own selfish desires. It would got us in trouble in the first place. But God wants you to come to Him through His Son. God wants you to receive His Son. And I'm going to tell you what He does. He's going to give you beauty for your ashes. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Scripture. He'll give you beauty for ashes. He'll give you a song of joy for mourning. He'll give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that you carry. It's all wins with Him. You will never lose with Christ. You will never lose with Him. But there's only one catch. And some of you may not like it. Some of you have theological bents that will mess you up. It all depends on you now. Jesus was nailed to that cross and He's was nailed between two thieves. I don't even know their names. You know the Bible doesn't even mention their names? I don't know if you paid close attention to the Gospel of Mark's rendering. It says that they both mocked him. That must have been like around 9 or 10 a.m. You know, because Jesus was nailed to the cross around 9. He died at around 3. Maybe at 9, like he stopped joking so much. This guy... 10 o'clock he heard him say Father forgive them for they know not what they do (laughs) around 10 20 he heard him say John this is your mother I I commit her to you never uttered one bad way like look I'm going to tell you right now I'm just going to be very candid with you if I was nailed to a cross I would be very angry I don't know if I would be able to demonstrate any form of decorum. None whatsoever. I get cranky if I don't get my coffee on time. He stood there. He was nailed there. 11 o'clock. Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. My God, my God. What is this guy talking about? This guy's saying things that aren't even crossing my mind. He still believes in God? One o'clock. Hey. Pull yourself up on the cross. I don't know if you understand that when people were nailed to the cross, they were being asphyxiated. It wasn't just nails through the hand. They were positioned in a way that they couldn't breathe. And in order for them to breathe, they had to pull on the nail. to heaven would you remember me Jesus pulls on the nails today 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 you will be with me in paradise I talked to a guy today If ever you do work around me, give it some time. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Spoke to a guy today. Invited him to church. 
He was working in our lobby on our little coffee station. And I said, uh, would you like to come to church tonight? He goes, no, nah, it's too far. I, I love when people say it's too far. I ask them, where do you live? We're done. <laughs> it's like a metro away. It's like, it's not like you're coming by horseback. Or you're getting spinal problems coming. I get it. Broke my heart when he told me his story. He says, oh, no, I was raised Baptist. I was raised in the church. I go, like, what is it? I said, let me guess. The hypocrisy, right? Yeah, how'd you know? Yeah, I've heard that story before. It's the religiosity, isn't it? Go, yeah. You know, it's, it's the thing, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the pride. Yeah. I said, listen. Look to Jesus. He's no fuss, no muss. He's not into all like the garbage that men add into everything. Jesus didn't ask, okay, what's your denominational association? Are you a Pharisee or are you, do you agree that you side with the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Let, let me get it. Let me guess. You believe in an afterlife? No? Yes? Yes? No. Have you been baptized? Do you know the creeds? Do you know the Nicene Creed by heart? Today. That's my Jesus. Even when he is beaten to a pulp and almost dead, he still has time for you. I'll pray for that guy. Hope he comes. Hope he comes to Christ. I, I, he has to come back and finish, so I'm not done. Oh, wait. If that doesn't work, he still has a final payment waiting. <laughs> if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what are you waiting for? I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. Why don't you stand to your feet just for a moment and then we're going to partake of the meal and I'll let you go. But I want to make sure that everyone knows Christ. Like I said, if people show up to my house, they're going to eat. We come to the Lord's house, you better believe that we're going to eat. He's going to make an offer to all of you. But if you're here today, and you don't know about tomorrow, and you don't know about your eternity, as a matter of fact, you wrestle with that. Some of you have been wrestling with it. Some of you are, are totally unaware, but now you're aware. There's a heaven, there's a hell. It's not by random that you go there. You make choices in life. And if I were to ask you the question, if tonight, it was the last night that you had on this earth, where would you wake up in the morning? Will you wake up in the presence of Jesus? Or would you wake up in pain and torture? Those are the choices. You decide choose wisely if you're here today and you don't know Jesus you say pastor I want to pray with you I want you to pray with me I want my name to be written in the Lamb's book of life would you just raise your hand wherever you are if you could raise it high enough so I can see it I didn't see tell me where I see that hand it's a good Friday for you and there's more I know that there's other people because you know what happens I see that hand. It's like here, people wander in here on Friday. They think it's a discotheque and they just walk in. Come on, I know that there's more. In a room this size, this full on a Friday, I know that there's more people. You're wondering, you're struggling. Maybe some of you have to make a strong commitment with the Lord tonight. You're fooling yourself and thinking that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but you're playing both sides. You're not getting in. Pastor, that's so rough. That's so not seeker-sensitive. I am not a seeker-sensitive preacher. I am a preacher of the truth. Either you're full in for Christ or you're not. Is there anyone else tonight? You you're going to walk out of this place knowing I'm going to heaven. Come on, is there someone else? Raise your hand so I can see it because I'm ready to pray with you. I see that hand right there. No. Oh. Someone else. There's more. You can't just sit there with a stone cold fit. You can look at me with hatred in your eyes all you want. It's not going to change anything. 
I don't know why people get mad when I'm telling them, listen, you want to go to heaven? Don't get mad. Go to heaven. Not tonight. Come on. I know there's others. Something's stirring inside of you. I'll tell you what that is. Because you're not familiar with that. That's the Holy Spirit working on your heart. Your heart's beating a little bit harder and a little bit faster. And you're asking yourself, should I go? Should I raise my hand? The answer is yes. Don't listen to your self-doubt. Don't listen to the enemy that would have no greater pleasure than to see you burn in hell. Anyone else? Because we got to eat and the food's getting cold. Anyone else? Quickly. Quickly. Up in the balcony. All right. I'm going to call those that raise their hand forward. I'm going to come down with you. And those of you that are um, undecided, you can come too. The invitation is still open. Why don't you come and pray with me? I want to pray with you. Ah. Hi. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. What's your name? Oh, wait. I think there was some more. Oh, here, there's more. Gabby, grab this side. Gabby, can you grab that side? It's like a little bit of space. I don't want to be in their face that way. Look how strong I am. One hand. Oh, he's done. Oh, I thought all of them were coming too. That's the choir. I would. If the choir doesn't know Jesus, we're in trouble. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. I like your daughter. She's cool. More. Anyone else? Make it a great Friday. Yeah. All right. We'll pray. You guys ready to pray? Yeah? This is what's going to happen. I'm going to pray. You're going to repeat what I say. I'm going to help you. That's me helping you pray. You have to believe it in your heart. And you have to say it with your mouth. The Bible says one believes in their heart and they confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it doesn't say we'll figure it out. Maybe they're saved. It says and they are saved. That's it. That's the beginning. And so you pray with all your heart, nice and loud, out loud, so God can hear you. So I can hear you too. All right? You ready? It's not complicated. Repeat these words with me, after me. Father, in, in Jesus' name, I come to you. I'm a sinner. And I need forgiveness. And I know that you sent your son to die for me. I confess all my sins. And I ask you to take them away. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. And that he came to the earth. He walked among us. And he was beaten and nailed to a cross and buried in a tomb. And after three days, rose again. I confess Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. And I promise, with the help of your Spirit, though, to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me a, a fresh start and forgiving my sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Right there. No, thank you. Thank you. You guys did it. This is the beginning of new life. This is the beginning of a new chapter. God has something wonderful in store for each and every one of you. Just trust in Him from this point on. I'm going to give you, I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to send you with that gentleman and he... 
No, good. He, he, he smiled. I was waiting for him to smile. He smiled. Eh? See the smiling gentleman? We have a gift for you. They're going to bring you right out these doors and then right back in. It's right in the hall. There's no secret trap, a secret room or whatever. And then you're going to come back in. You know what we do? Maybe we have communion first. After we have communion. Because now it's time to party. It's time for us to share a meal. Can I ask you to do me this one favor? Because normally we do it a little different. After we, we partake of this meal and you leave, would you find him in the hallway? There's a big banner right outside. What does it say? Connect team. Connect team. You go right to there. You're going to see him there. Look at him. You can't miss him. The shine. <laughs> you said it. And we have a gift for you. And I want to tell you what that gift is. There's a lot of nice little things, but the most important thing is a copy of the Word of God. You need that. That's the truth. That's the story of Jesus. That's the story of your redemption, your salvation, and His promises for you, and what's still going to happen. Because you know what the best part is? Jesus is coming back. And He's going to come and take us home. And we're all going together. Amen? You excited? I'm excited. You know what, for now, go back to your seats, and then you look for shiny Manny after the service, and we'll eat together. Thank you so much. God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. What's your name? Adriano. Adriano. It's nice to meet you. You're a brave guy. I'm glad you came. You guys ready to partake of a meal? Gabby, can you help me? Oh, there you are. Thank you. If you have, I hope, does everyone have a little cup? Does everyone have a little cup? A little cup with the juice and the, the wafer? If you don't have one, would you raise your hand? The ushers are going to come by and give you one. Like you see the usher standing in the aisle. There's one right over here. Lisa, right there. Anyone to the side there? If you don't have one, just wave down an usher. Trip them. We want to make sure everyone's ready. Has everyone, has everyone been served? You know, <clears throat> this is what the Bible says. I read it for you before in 1 Corinthians, so I'm just going to say it to you. You know, it always makes the point of saying, on the night that he was betrayed, I always focus on that. I never want to betray Jesus. Never. He's not worthy of that. But he's so good that on the night that he was betrayed, he broke bread. He broke the bread. And he said, this bread is my body. And it's been given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. So I'm going to ask you, take the bread for a moment. And I want you to think about, before we, we eat together, of the cost. Of what this symbolizes. The cost was the cross. He had his body broken so that we could be made whole. By the way, I want to add some more to it. If you're here tonight and... You're sick in body. There's something that's not feeling right or is off in your body. Something you've been asking the Lord. I want you to understand that this isn't just some commemoration meal. This is a very powerful meal. Because the Bible says that even before Jesus went to the cross, they strapped him to a column and they whipped him. The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before that ever happened, he prophesied that the suffering servant, Jesus, he writes, by his stripes, we are healed. Yes. Healing becomes because of the broken body of Christ, not because of the cross. When Jesus gets to the cross, that's where he heals the broken spirit. That's where he dies and sheds his blood for the remission of sin. So we're going to eat this bread, and when we eat this bread, I'm going to pray, and... 
if I'm speaking to one of you tonight that has some ailment, some problem, sickness, some chronic problem, whatever it is, you name it, I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus has a name that's greater. And Jesus has the power to heal. And when we come to this table, there's grace to be had, not just in remembering what he did, but power to fix. And if you need fixing, that's what Jesus specializes in. Are you ready to eat the bread together? Let's do it. Father, we thank you for the broken body of Christ. The broken body of your son who died for me. I thank you, Father, that before he went to the cross that he took a, an inhumane beating. That the, his life was almost ripped from him then. That he suffered some of the most atrocious injuries. But Lord, you were able to take those injuries and make it for our good, that by his stripes we are healed. And I thank you, O oh God, because the body was broken for us. And Jesus asked us that when we eat this bread, to do it in remembrance of him. And so we remember our Jesus. We remember what he did. We remember the price that he paid so that my life and sins could be made whole. And so that my sins could be forgiven. I thank you, O oh God. We will not stand still. But because of that, we will remember and act. I read it to you before in 1 Corinthians 10, 25. It says, and then in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this represents my blood. It is the symbol of the new covenant. And when you drink this, as often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me because you proclaim my death until, until I come. I love those words. He's telling us, you're proclaiming my death. You're remembering my death. You're remembering what I did until I come back to get you. I'm excited about that. How many of you are excited about the return of Jesus? That's, that's also, aside from the, the washing of your sins and the forgiveness of your sins, he's reminding us, saying, I'm coming. Hang on. I'm coming. Just the same way the people sat there at Passover and they ate that meal with anticipation that they were going to be delivered and freed. I mean, you know what? Some of us are so fixated on what's going on in the world around us. We, we, we think we're being oppressed. Don't worry about the oppression of the world. Don't think about that. Because Jesus is coming back. I want to tell you what about this story. This is the last thing before we drink. Like I said, this is a story worth remembering and repeating. You think that the story of Jesus and the crucifixion is going to stop being repeated on this side of heaven? It's the anthem of heaven. It's going to be repeated over and over and over and over again for all eternity. And we're going to rejoice in it because that's the reason why we're sitting in his presence. God has made us so many wonderful promises through Jesus. So when we drink this meal, you know, I used to drink, I used to take this meal and drink and eat the bread and I used to sit there like this. I would cry, I would weep. Because I thought Jesus was gone. Through this meal, he's saying, I'm right here. And one day you'll see me and I'm coming back. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the blood. And we drink this, oh God. And we remember you. We remember the blood that was shed. That washed us white as snow. We thank you that we are new and that we've been made whole through Jesus. We thank you for your promises because they are yes and amen. We thank you because you don't lie and you don't change your mind. And we look forward to that day when we get to see you face to face. In Jesus' name, let's drink together.
separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You had me in your side So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Place, wait inside.
Hallelujah. You happy you came to church tonight? Me too. Tomorrow night, Silent Saturday. It ain't going to be so silent. We have over 60 people that are going to be baptized tonight. some weights tonight. I'm ready. Tomorrow, come out. Celebrate. It's not going to be complicated or long and drawn out, but the thing is, we're going to get to witness. This is like a great joy. We're going to get to witness 60 people walking through the waters of baptism. You know, in a, in a day and age where people say, people don't, people don't go to church anymore. I don't know what they're talking about. People don't want Jesus anymore. Well, I can tell you about 60 of them. I tell you about a little bit more than 60 of them. And so come out, come ready to celebrate. I know that it's not the norm. I know that a lot of people don't go to church on Saturday. But you know what? Um, it's Easter weekend. I think some people have like this idea of making it about everything else about Jesus. Same thing with Christmas. Let's make it all about Jesus. Let's make it about the mission. Let's make it. Come and celebrate. We'll expect you here tomorrow. We'll have a a good old time worshiping the Lord and then baptizing a whole lot of people. I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Say, Father, let his biceps not fail him tomorrow. <laughs> let that happen Saturday. Uh, Sunday. Not Saturday. Sunday. I'm just kidding. Now it's easy to baptize people. They sit. It's easy. But I'm looking forward to it. I want to pray. Can we pray and I'll let you go? Father, we are very blessed people. I think sometimes we're so busy asking that we forget to say thank you. You have been so good to us in every way. The most important way is through Jesus. We thank you for saving us, for changing us, for being patient with us, for filling us with your spirit, for giving us purpose, and for helping us every single day. Father, we're grateful for what Jesus had to go through on that cross that day. But we're grateful that he sits at the right hand of the Father. And now, Father, we too, according to your word, are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we take none of these things for granted. Father, help us in these days to be people of action, to be people who carry on the mission, who preach the gospel no matter what the cost. Because we know that the coming of the sun is near. And before we go, we want to make sure that everyone we've come in contact with had an opportunity to receive your son. As you have given to us so graciously and freely, we want to do the same for others. We don't walk out of here just thinking about the blessing for ourselves. Lord, help us to be a blessing to others. Father, I pray for divine appointments. I pray for every single person, Lord, who thinks that they can't do it, but that you would fill their mouths by your spirit with the life-changing words, the power of God unto salvation, which is the gospel. And Father, that many, many, many would come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your word stands forever, says the harvest is ready and white, but the laborers are few. And Father, I pray that you would scan this room and see a room full of laborers who love to labor because of the goodness you bestowed on us. We love you with all our hearts. Watch over us, Lord, we ask. Bring us back to this place so that we can celebrate some more, so that we can watch 60 people or more, whatever you have in store, walk through the waters of baptism and declare their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great privilege that we have to do that. We honor you tonight. Be with us as we go our separate ways. Let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding be ours now and forevermore. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Greet one another with the love of Jesus tomorrow, 6 p.m. God bless you.